Marxist Theory and the Proletariat by Rosa Luxemburg. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. That's a quotation from Marx. 20 years ago, Marx laid his towering head to rest. And although we only experienced a couple of years ago what in the language of German professors is called the crisis of Marxism, it suffices to throw a glance at the masses that today follow socialism alone in Germany and at socialism's importance in all so-called civilized countries. In order to grasp the immensity of the work of Marx's thought. If it mattered to express in few words what Marx did for the contemporary working class, then one could say Marx has uncovered the modern working class's historical category, that is, as a class with particular historical conditions of existence and laws of motion. A mass of wage workers who were led to solidarity by the similarity of their social existence in bourgeois society and looked for a way out of their condition and partly for a bridge to the promised land of socialism, arguably existed in capitalist countries before Marx. Marx was the first who elevated workers to the working class by linking them through the specific historical task of conquering political power in the socialist revolution. Class struggle for conquering political power was the bridge that Marx built between socialism and the proletarian movement that elementarily rises up from the ground of contemporary society. The bourgeoisie has always shown sure instinct when it followed the proletariat's political aspirations with hatred and fear. Already in November 1831, when reporting on the working class's initial impulses on the continent to the French Chamber of Deputies, Casimir Perrier said, Gentlemen, we can be relieved. Nothing politically has emerged from Lyon's labor movement. The dominant classes namely considered every political impulse of the proletariat as an early sign of the coming emancipation of the workers from the bourgeoisie's paternalism. It was only Marx who succeeded in putting working class politics on the foundation of conscious class struggle and to thereby forge it into a deadly weapon directed against existing society's order. The materialist conception of history in general and the Marxian theory of capitalist development in particular form the foundation of contemporary social democratic labor politics. Only some, someone to whom the essence of social democratic politics and the essence of Marxism are equally a mystery can think of class conscious labor politics outside of Marxian theory. In his Feuerbach, Engels formulated the essence of philosophy as the eternal question about the relationship between thought and being, the question of human consciousness in the objective material world. If we transfer the, transfer the concepts of being and thought from the abstract world of nature and individual speculation, where two professional philosophers stick with iron determination, to the realm of societal, societal life, then the same can, in a particular sense, be said about socialism. Socialism has always been the feeling for and the search for means and ways to bring being into accord with thought, namely to bring the historical forms of existence into accord with societal consciousness. It was left to Marx and his friend Engels to find the solution to a centuries old painstaking task. Marx has revealed history's most important driving force by discovering that the history of all hitherto existing societies is in the last instance, the history of its relations of production and exchange, whose development manis manifests itself under the rule of private property in the political and social institutions as class struggle. Thereby we gained an explanation of the necessary disparity between consciousness and being in all hitherto existing forms of society, between human will and social action, and between intentions and results. Humanity first uncovered the secret behind its own societal process thanks to Marxian ideas. Furthermore, the discovery of the laws of capitalist development also expounded the way that society took, for, took from its natural, conscious stage during which history was made in the manner that, that bees construct their honeycombs, to the stage of conscious, deliberate, true human history 
wherein for the first time society's will and action come into accord with each other, so that the social human will for the first time in millennia do that what she, what she or he wants to do. To speak with Engels, this final leap from the kingdom of necessity to the kingdom of freedom that only the socialist revolution will realize for society as a whole already takes place within the existing order in social democratic politics. With the Ariadne thread of Marxist theory in its hand, the Workers' Party is today the only party that knows from the historical point of view what it does and therefore does what it desires. This is the whole secret of social democracy's power. The bourgeois world has long been puzzled by social democracy's astonishing resilience and steady progress. From time to time, there are single senile silly billies who, blinded by special moral successes of our politics, advise the bourgeoisie to learn a lesson from our example and from social democracy's secret wisdom and idealism. They do not understand that what is a source of life and fountain of youth and energy for the aspiring working class politics is deadly poison for the bourgeois parties. Because what it is that in fact gives us the inner moral strength to endure and shake off the biggest repression, such as a dozen years of the laws against socialists with such laughing courage, is if for instance, the disin disinherited, disinherited keenness to pursue small improvements of their condition. The modern proletariat is unlike the Philistine and the petty bourgeois not willing to become a hero for the sake of everyday comforts. The plain, sober big bigotry of the world of English trade unions shows how little the pure prospect, prospect of small material gains for the working class is capable of creating a moral flight of fancy. Is it the ascetic stoicism of a sect that as many that as among the original Christians flickers up all the more brightly, the more persecution there is? The modern proletarian is, as errant pupil of bourgeois society, far too much a born materialist and a healthy sensual human of flesh and blood to alone draw love and strength for his ideas from torture in accordance with slave morality. Is it, finally, the justice of our cause that makes us so impregnable? The causes of the Chartists, the followers of Waitling, and the utopian socialist schools were no less just than our cause, but nonetheless, they all soon succumb to modern society's resilience. If the contemporary labor movement victoriously shakes the mains, defying all the acts of violence of the enemy world, then this is especially due to its calm understanding of the lawfulness of the objective historical development, the understanding of the fact that capitalist production begets with the inexorability of a natural process its own negation, namely the expropriation of the expropriators, the socialist revolution. It is this insight from which the labor movement draws the firm guarantee of its final victory, not just impetuosity, but also the patience, the power to action, and the courage to endure. The first condition of successful politics of struggle is understanding the movements of the opponent. But what is the key to understanding bourgeois politics down to its smallest ramifications and the labyrinths of daily politics so that we are equally protected from surprises and illusions? The key is nothing more than the insight that one must explain all forms of societal consciousness in their inner turmoil from the interests of classes and groups, from the antagonisms of material life, and in the last instance, from the conflict existing between the social forces of production and the relations of production. And what gives us the capability to adapt our politics to new appearances of political life, such as, for example, world politics, and especially to assess it, also without special talent and profundity, with the depth of judgment that gets to the core of the appearance itself, while the most talented bourgeois critics only scratch on its surface or get caught up in hopeless antagonisms at every glance into the depth. Again, nothing else than the overview of historical development based on the law that the mode of production of material life conditions the general process of social, political, and intellectual life. What is it that provides us above all with a measure for avoiding in the selection of struggles, ways and means, aimless experiments and utopianist escapades that are a waste of energy? 
Once the direction of the economic and political process of contemporary society has been understood, this understanding can act as a measure not just of the overall direction of our campaign plan, but also of every detail of our political efforts. Thanks to this guideline, the working class has managed for the first time to transform the idea of socialism as the ultimate aim into daily politics, divisional coins, and to elevate the everyday political detail work to the big ideas executive tool. There was bourgeois politics led by workers and there was revolutionary socialism before Marx. But only since Marx and through Marx has a socialist working class politics existed that is at the same time and in the fullest meaning of both words, revolutionary, real politic. If we understand by real politic, a politics that only sets itself achievable goals that it pursues to obtain by the most effective means in the shortest time, then the difference between proletarian class politics that stands in the Marxian spirit and bourgeois politics is that bourgeois politics is real from the standpoint of material daily politics, whereas socialist politics is real from the standpoint of the historical tendency of development. Exactly the same difference can be found between a vulgar economic theory of value that conceives of value as a thing in appearance from the standpoint of the market stall and Marxian theory that conceives of value as a societal relation in a particular historical epoch. But proletarian real politic is also revolutionary in that it goes in all the parts of its endeavors beyond the bounds of the existing order in which it operates, but consciously regarding itself only as the preliminary stage of the act that turns proletarian real politic into the politics of the ruling revolutionary proletariat. In this manner, Marxist theory penetrates and enlightens everything. The moral power by which we overcome perils, our tactics of struggle, even its last details, our critique of opponents, our everyday agitation by which we win the masses, our entire work down to the tips of the fingers. And if we here and there indulge in the illusion that our politics is today with all its inner power independent from Marxist theory, then this only shows that our praxis speaks in Marxist terms, although we do not know it, just like Moliere's bourgeois spoke in prose. It suffices that we visualize Marx's achievements in order to understand that bourgeois society made him its deadly enemy because of his concept of the working class's socialist revolution. It became evident to the dominant classes that overcoming the modern labor movement meant overcoming Marx. In the 20 years since Marx's death, we have seen a constant series of attempts to destroy Marx's spirit in the labor movement's theory and praxis. The labor movement has from the start of its history navigated between the two poles of revolutionary socialist utopianism and bourgeois real politic. Wholly absolutist or semi-absolutist pre-bourgeois society form the historical soil of the first. The revolutionary utopian stage of socialism in Western Europe is by and large concluded by the development of bourgeois class rule, although we can observe single relapses into it until today. The other danger, getting lost in bourgeois real politics patchwork, has only emerged in the course of the labor movements strengthening on the floor of parliamentarism. The idea was that bourgeois parliamentarism would provide weapons for practically overcoming the proletariat's revolutionary po politics, and that the democratic union of the classes and social peace brought about by reforms should replace class struggle. And what has been achieved? The illusion may have here and there lasted for a while, but the unsuitability of real politics bourgeois methods for the working class became immediately evident. The fiasco of ministerialism in France, the betrayal by liberalism in Belgium, the breakdown of parliamentarism in Germany, the short dream of quiet development strike by strike broke to pieces. The Marxian law of the tendency of the sharpening of social contrasts as foundation of class struggle asserted itself, and every day brings new signs and wonders. In the Netherlands, 24 hours of the railway strike like an earthquake overnight opened up a yawning gap in the middle of society, from which class struggle blazed out. Holland is on fire. So, in the light of the March of the Worker Battalions, the base of bourgeois democracy and bourgeois legislation, 
breaks down like a thin ice sheet and again and again makes the working class aware that its final goal cannot be achieved on this base. All of this is the result of the many attempts to practically overcome Marx. Hundreds of industrious apologists have made the theoretical overcoming of Marxism their life task and the springboard of their careers. What have they achieved? They have managed to create in the circles of the faithful intelligentsia the conviction that Marx's works are one-sided and exaggerated. But even those of the bourgeois ideologues who can be taken serious, such as Stamler, have understood that nothing can be achieved with a bit more or a bit less half-truths against such a deep and profound theory. But what can bourgeois academia oppose to Marxian theory as a whole? Since Marx has emphasized the historical standpoint of the working class in the fields of philosophy, history, and economics, bourgeois research in these fields has lost the thread. The classical philosophy of nature has come to an end. The bourgeois philosophy of history has come to an end. Scientific political economy has come to an end. In historical research, as far as there, as far as there is not the dominance of an unconscious and inconsequent materialism, an eclecticism shimmering in all colors has taken the place of any unified theory. So, so there is the relinquishment of the unified explanation of the process of history, i.e. of the philosophy of history as such. Economics oscillates between two schools, the historical one and the subjective one. The one is a protest against the other, and both are a protest against Marx. The first one negates economic theory, i.e. the knowledge in this field, in principle, in order to negate Marx, whereas the other one negates the only objective research method that first turned political economy into a science. Certainly, the Social Science Book Fair every month brings whole mountains of products that result from bourgeois industriousness to the market, and the thickest volumes written by ambitious, modern professors are put out at large-scale capitalist machine-like speed. But in such diligent monographs, either research buries its head like an ostrich into the sand of small, fragmented phenomena so that it does not have to see broader connections and only works for daily needs. Or research only simulates thoughts and social theories that are in the last instance just reflexes of Marx's thoughts that are hidden under overloaded tinsel ornaments that appeal to the taste associated with commodities of the modern bazaar. Autonomous flights of thought, a daring glance into the distance, or an invigorating deduction are nowhere to be found. And if social progress has again created a new series of scientific problems, then again only the Marxian method offers ways for solving them. So it is everywhere just theorylessness, epistemological skepticism, that bourgeois social science is able to oppose to Marxian knowledge. Marxian theory is a child of bourgeois science, but the birth of this child has cost the mother her life. Therefore, the upturn of the working class has knocked the weapons out of bourgeois society's hands that the latter wanted to use on the battlefield against Marxian socialism. And today, 20 years after Marx's death, bourgeois society is all the more powerless against him, but Marx more alive than ever. Of course, contemporary society has one comfort left. While society struggles in vain to find a means to overcome Marx's theory, it does not notice that the only real means of doing so are hidden in this theory itself. Because it is through and through historical, Marxian theory only claims temporarily limited validity. Because it is through and through dialectical, it carries in itself the definite seed of its own dissolution. If we abstract from its unchanging part, namely from the historical method of research, then Marxian theory in its most general outlines consists of insights into the historical way that leads from the last antagonistic form of society, i.e. societies that are based on class conflicts, to the communist society that is built on all members' solidarity of interests. Marxian theories especially, just like earlier classical theories of political economy, the mental reflex of a particular period of economic and political development, namely the transition from the capitalist to the socialist phase of history. But it is more than just a reflex. The historical transition that Marx identified can namely not take place 
without Marxian knowledge having become the knowledge of a particular class in society, the modern proletariat. That Marxist theory becomes the working class, class's form of consciousness, and as such an element of history is the precondition for the realization of the historical revolution formulated in Marxist theory. Marxist theory proves to be true continuously with every new proletarian who supports class struggle. So Marxist theory is at the same time part of the historical process and is also itself a process. Social, revolu social revolution will be the communist manifesto's final chapter. Consequently, the part of Marxian theory that is most dangerous to the existing order of society will sooner or later be overcome, but only together with the existing order of society.